Bush's vision, right, of the America, of Pax Americana, uh, of the next period of Pax Americana, seems to be not only that the United States will be a global cop, but the American economy will be geared almost uniquely to providing the weaponry, right, and the backup for that g role on an international basis. Uh, our governments are engaged, and to the extent that we think we're responsible for the actions of our governments, we're engaged uh, in uh, a, a large-scale uh, mass slaughter, uh, to which the word genocide is not inappropriate, uh, in East Timor, and in fact, relative to size, probably the major, major slaughter uh, since uh, the Second World War. The fact that there is a com there's a continuing refusal within the Bush administration for any kind of reindustrialization program, for any kind of economic policies which would uh, support uh, a, re a revitalization, let's say, of the consumer goods industry so they could compete with the West Europeans and the Japanese. The absence of those things uh, suggests that we're headed into a future which, on the one hand, has this incredibly wealthy military-industrial complex supporting the role in, you know, global role of the United States as, as global cop, and on the other hand, uh, continued widespread poverty, uh, continued decline in American standard of living of the average Americans, no solution to the problems of the cities. We will look at the economic consequences of the Gulf War, the new war, as well as what has been happening in the old war with Indonesia invading East Timor right now on Alternative Views. <laughs> presentation on the new war, the Gulf War, we will consider the economic bases and the consequences of this war and Bush's new world order. Dr. Harry Cleaver of the Economics Department of the University of Texas will provide us with a perspective which the establishment media will not bring to you. We also have a documentary about East Timor. East Timor betrayed but not beaten. It is a Canadian documentary made from the Canadian perspective, but we must remember that the United States has been supportive all the way through of the Indonesians. And now, before we have Harry Cleaver's interpretation of George Bush's New World Order, let's take a look back at the economic bases of the Gulf War. American interest in the Gulf have always been centered around oil. Uh, for as long as the United States has been there, ever since the United States sought to replace the British as the major influence in the Gulf area. They're interested in oil and they're interested in the control of the people who produce oil, not only the countries, but the, the workers who are put to work pulling the oil out of the ground and shipping it off. That's been the interest, and it cont I think it continues to be. Um, beyond that, of course, you need to understand why they would be interested so much in that oil, particularly in Kuwaiti oil, let's say Iraqi oil, because we really don't use that much of it. The control over oil is not simply control over the American economy. We didn't go to war simply to guarantee that there would be cheap oil in the United States. This is control over oil which is primarily of interest to the Japanese, to the Western Europeans, and to a lot of other people. Control over that kind of oil means control over the world economy of a rather profound sort. It means that the United States is in a position to broker the supply of one of the economy's most basic commodities on world markets. And they need and have always wanted a local power structure, a distribution of power in the region that they could influence. Uh, for a long time now, they've been using the Saudi Arabians and the Kuwaitis up until the invasion, of course. Before that, they were using the Shah of Iran. Uh, they, in fact, had intervened in Iran to overthrow the elected government. Uh, to install the Shah back in 1953, and they continued to support him right up until the revolution that overthrew the Shah in 1978, at which point they had to abandon that strategy and, uh, and find another one. Uh, 
if you follow American policy in that area, do I say right through the Iraq-Iran war, the United States was always moving to prevent the emergence of any local hegemonic power which was not beholden to the United States. Uh, we switched back and forth uh, in that area. You remember the Iranians took American hostages, so we were against Iran. But when Iraq invaded Iran, Jimmy Carter came out and said, we can't afford to have a weak Iran. This is while the hostages were still being held. So we essentially were shift, shifting to help support, at least morally, if not otherwise, the Iranians at that point. When Iraq looked like it might win, or excuse me, when the fortunes reversed and Iran looked like it might conquer Iraq, we flipped sides again and supported the Iraqis against the Iranians. Always the same purpose, maintain a balance of power that the United States could control and broker in order to be able to control energy, which is the, one of the most necessary and basic ingredients to the world economy. Now let's take a look at George Bush's New World Order and see what it's going to mean to the economy of all Americans. First, let's look at OPEC. We can, we can look ahead and see what's going to happen in the future of the international petroleum markets. In the first place, the enormous supplies that have been built up over the last six months, or seven, eight months now, uh, due to fears about what might happen to supplies. You know, did the, would the Iraqis be able to blow up the Saudi uh, production facilities and pumping facilities. If they were, then there might be a cutback in world oil supplies, which there really hasn't been up until now. Everybody's been stocking it up. They say there's a, a glut right now. Well, there's a glut, and but there's more than a glut. There's these huge stockpiles that are being held. And when the war is over, those stockpiles are going to be disgorged. Uh, production, the other countries outside of Kuwait and, and, and Iraq quickly increase production to bring production up and beyond what it was before the invasion. So there's plenty of oil. And when the, all this other oil is disgorged, the price of oil is going to plummet. That's clear enough. But as, as soon as that disgorging is over, the price of oil is going to come back up again. And when you look at current capacities, uh, production capacities in the world, you look at the biggest producers in the world, the Soviet Union, the United States, the OPEC countries, uh, North Sea Oil, uh, the projections of the U.S. Energy Department are towards the rest of the century seeing a constant rise in the percentage of world oil pumped by OPEC. It went down uh, for a while, but they're expecting it to go back up, way back up, towards 65% and more of world oil. So in fact, the long run outlook has been within the U.S. Energy Department for OPEC to be a bigger player than it has been, right, since the third oil shock, since oil prices dropped precipitously in the wake of the Reagan Depression of 1901, 1982. That's the OPEC that the United States wants to control. Mm. That's the OPEC that it wants to make, it wants to be able to control and manage the amount of oil that it pumps, and the amount of oil it sells on world markets, so that it serves U.S. purposes. And what we need to ask ourselves are, what are those purposes, right? What is, what is the Bush administration, and not only his oil friends, but his business friends gain from managing it, from, in particular, from doing what apparently they want to do with it, which is to keep oil prices up. Not to bring oil prices down to defend the famous American way of life, which has been going out the door <laughs> steadily for over 10 years now. They want to keep it up, which is going to continue to hammer down standards of living. It's going to make a lot of money for the oil companies. In fact, they made so much money in the last quarter that they're embarrassed to talk about it. Uh, they're not going to do that in the next quarter because prices have come down. But in the long haul, with a $25 a barrel price, they're going to make a lot of money. But more than that, We've now seen with the Bush energy proposals, which have now, been, can now come out, we don't have to speculate anymore, what the response is going to be. Now you would expect, right, in a rational world, that high oil prices would mean conservation, high oil prices would mean cutback in utilization, shift to development of other resources. Absolutely not. Oil, Bush's only serious proposal in there is to increase pumping of oil, open up the Alaskan wilderness, to hell with the caribou. To hell with a tundra, pump oil. The fact that they're only going to get 3.2 billion barrels out of it, which will only supply American needs for six months, you know, is beside the point. Open up drilling off the coast of California. In fact, the administration's proposals have been put out not only in written form, but in the form of a map in which these huge areas are blackened in around, off, offshore around the United States, showing the areas that they want to open up. In virtually the entire uh, area off the coast of Alaska is to be opened up, some areas off the coast of California, 
and areas off the east coast of the United States are supposed to be open. And they're in black as sites of future oil spill. Absolutely. Pollution. I'm sure it's the, a Freudian the slip. The symbolism <laughs> is a little bit uh, uh, revealing here. But that's exactly the way the map looks. What you're looking at there is a Gulf oil spill on a, on a continental basis. Right. And, of course, the other thing that they have in mind is the revitalization of the nuclear, nuclear power yeah. industry. And that, that we were, there were speculations about that because for the last six months, the nuclear lobby has been running these ads, right, with the, the cobra made out of oil barrels, this vicious-looking cobra with foreign oil on it in all, almost every magazine that you can think about. Uh, they've been pushing it. Well, now the administration has made quite clear where it stands, and it is, is calling for a reduction on the controls of nuclear energy. Right? I mean, after all, the Russians have a Chernobyl. Why can't we have two or three? We will return later with Dr. Harry Cleaver, of the Economics Department of the University of Texas, talking about the new war and the economic consequences of it. The new war, of course, being the Gulf War. But there are a lot of old wars, some which are still going on. For instance, Turkey invaded northern Cyprus decades ago and virtually annexed it and caused a lot of deaths, a couple of thousands, according to some reports. Israel, of course, attacked Lebanon and killed about 20,000 people, still occupies a portion of that country. And, of course, Israel still occupies sections of Palestine and severely represses the Arabs there. Morocco invaded Western Sahara and has, for all intents and purposes, annexed it, even though there is still a guerrilla opposition to the Moroccans. The United States, oh, look what they've done invaded Grenada, invaded Panama, their surrogates invaded and destroyed the economy of Nicaragua and Angola. And the other countries listed here, El Salvador, Chile, and Iran, are only a few where the Americans overtly and covertly have caused a tremendous amount of damage and loss of life over the years. As former CIA person John Stockwell said, this is just a small portion of them. There are at least 50 of them going on around the world. Syria invaded Lebanon and has annexed it in a very bloody operation. But the most bloody, the most genocidal has been Indonesia's war against East Timor. If you haven't heard about it, well, you can thank the U.S. government and the U.S. media. This is the old war we will talk about. The Center for Defense Information in Washington, D.C. describes the war in East Timor as the most violent war in the world, involving the greatest loss of life in terms of percent of the population killed. When Indonesia invaded East Timor in 1975, access to the island became severely restricted. Today, the media blackout is in force. This is the first documentary on East Timor to be made in North America. It was made by the Canadians. In 1949, after four centuries of control, Holland surrendered its colonies in Southeast Asia. 200 cultures spread across 13,000 islands, which had comprised the Dutch East Indies, now became Indonesia. Today, Indonesia has the fifth largest population in the world. On December 7, 1975, the Indonesian military invaded East Timor, which had been a Portuguese colony for 400 years. They fired from air, from sea, from earth, bombs, bombs from, from uh, uh, warships near uh, Atauru. Huh? from ship to put the fire, fire bombs on Dili, on Dili and uh, his outskirts in order to kill everything, every what they, they find. Oh, that was to them as massacre. Uh, so it was really, uh, it begins with a, ma a massacre, slaughter. The mountainous island of Timor lies 600 kilometers north of Australia. West Timor, a former Dutch colony, was annexed by Indonesia in 1949. 
After a brief civil war between the two nationalist parties, the Democratic Republic of East Timor was proclaimed. The governing party, the Revolutionary Front for an Independent East Timor, Fredolin, sought peaceful relations with Indonesia. The Indonesian government, weary of separatist movements in its territories, felt threatened by the example of a small independent nation on its doorstep. The ensuing invasion has claimed over 200,000 Timorese lives and continues to this day. The U.S. and Canada, and in fact the West generally, has ignored the situation in East Timor in part. It hasn't ignored it totally. So, for example, the United States, uh, England, and other countries have been very pleased to uh, send arms to Indonesia, it's profitable and it helps them consummate the massacre. They've been interested in this sense. Uh, but the actual ongoing slaughter itself has been of no concern to the West, except that they want it to be consummated efficiently and effectively, uh, and they would like to see uh, East Timor integrated into Indonesia. Why uh, this uh, uh, attitude towards uh, uh, slaughter, uh, one of the major slaughters of the modern period, in fact, relative to size, probably the major, major slaughter uh, since uh, the Second World War? Well, the answer to that question uh, goes back to the, uh, uh, really, uh, it leads us to broader um, geopolitical uh, uh, considerations and historical considerations. We have to really go back to the end of the Second World War. Uh, after the Second World War, as the United States was essentially organizing a world system that it intended to dominate and assigning each area its proper role, uh, the uh, Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, uh, was, if you look at the secret documents now declassified, you find that Southeast Asia was assigned a specific function. It was to fulfill its function, as the State Department put it. It was to fulfill its function as a source of raw materials and, and uh, uh, resources uh, for uh, the industrial West. Canada is involved in Indonesia because it's a particularly good place to go if you want no unions to worry about workers who are treated very badly, workers whom you don't have to pay a great deal of money to, and an army to back up a no-strike situation. Uh, what happened in 1965 was that there was a right-wing coup which was headed by General Suharto, who has ever since been the president of Indonesia. Uh, in the aftermath of the coup, at least, according to CIA statistics, 700,000 people were killed. And the estimate actually goes above uh, 1 million if you go to Amnesty International. In the aftermath of that, naturally the population was terrorized, all the uh, effective unions were smashed, and it became a perfect investment climate for countries like Canada. I would like to draw honorable members' attention to the presence in the gallery today of His Excellency Dr. Mokhtar Kusamadamadja, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia. <laughs> honorable member for Eglinton Lawrence. Mr. Speaker, the Secretary of State for External Affairs knows that Canada has allotted $300 million in aid through CETA to uh, Indonesia over a five-year period. Uh, and in fact, that represents the fourth largest Canadian uh, program of aid in all of Asia. How can this government continue to ignore the fact that Indonesia has invaded East Timor with 40,000 troops and is conducting Operation Extinction, which is tantamount to genocide? What kind of representations will this Secretary of State of Canada for Foreign Affairs make to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Dr. Mokhtar, who is in fact right here in Ottawa at the present time? Mr. Speaker, I trust that the Right Honourable Leader of the Opposition is embarrassed by this kind of grandstanding. <laughs> here, here. He says, he says he isn't, Mr. Speaker, which speaks volumes of his judgment. Here, here. The honourable member is, the honourable member, the honourable member is uh, considerably out of date with his uh, accusations with regard to uh, East Timor. I have, in fact, discussed the matter with uh, Dr. Mokhtar during my visit to Indonesia in 1985. Uh, at our suggestion, the uh, Canadian ambassador in uh, in Indonesia was uh, uh, was invited to uh, visit East Timor to see conditions for himself. 
He believes that the uh, arguments that have been made by various groups uh, are exaggerated. I'm sure that I speak for the government of Indonesia in indicating that they would be prepared. That they would be prepared. That they would be prepared to uh, welcome. <laughs> that they would be prepared to welcome the honourable member uh, to come and see for himself. That would be a change in the basis of his representations in this house if they were based on fact. What in fact happened, just the essence of it, uh, is that in uh, 1975, the Indonesian government attacked the neighboring uh, island of Timor, East Timor, which had been a Portuguese colony. Uh, they had never laid any claim to it, had no claim to it, nor did any uh, international uh, uh, is there any, any basis in international law or elsewhere for such a claim? Uh, in the course of this attack, which uh, uh, has now been going on for 12 years, uh, in, in the first stages of it, there was, in fact, a very large-scale massacre. Uh, by 1977, the Indonesian army had actually run out of arms, uh, depleted its arms supplies in uh, the course of this uh, aggression. The Carter administration, at that point, uh, took a little time off from its... Uh, uh, passionate uh, rhetoric about uh, its concern for human rights uh, so as to uh, s significantly ex uh, escalate the arms flow to Indonesia to enable it to consummate the slaughter. The major uh, massacres in which perhaps several hundred thousand people were killed out of a population of 700,000 initially, uh, they took place after the, um, the Carter administration uh, increased the arms flow to uh, uh, Indonesia with the conscious knowledge that this would be the consequence. Uh, that's when the, uh, pop what with the remnants of the population which had fled to the hills were driven down to Indonesian-run concentration camps uh, and so on. Meanwhile, uh, Canada was also, uh, the, the Canadian media, for example, were totally silent about all of this. The Canadian government has simply endorsed, officially endorsed uh, the most ludicrous uh, Indonesian propaganda about the uh, uh, Timorese uh, requesting uh, uh, Indonesia to uh, intervene, to annex them to Indonesia, and so on. Uh, and meanwhile, of course, uh, Canadian corporations are enriching themselves by not in Timor, which is too small to be of interest to them, but in Indonesia, uh, where uh, Canada is the major uh, uh, Western investor and therefore extremely supportive of uh, Indonesian atrocities, uh, aggression, and brutality. You kill a lot of them recently? Oh no, no, no. We 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 never kill him because they are our family, our family, like the other family. Uh, in, in, in the other part of Indonesia. All of the people in right here is our family, so we do not kill him. Of course not. Brutal murders by Indonesian troops have silenced many voices of opposition. Fearing for the safety of relatives still in East Timor, refugees can only speak out under conditions of anonymity. I have been beaten too. And my friends, some of my, uh, some, some are my friends have been, um, they have been put them into the into the tank full of water, and then they obliged, they forced my my these friends to be under the water as long as they want, and when the, my when these friends resist under the water, they they try to come up and to to come up of the water to breathe and then they 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 hit with the with the butt of the gun or or they they or they beat them with the with rods and after that they 
they they ban these friends with cigarettes. The people of East Timor are inhabitants of the island for thousands of years. Before the invasion in 1975, there were about 700,000 people, most of which were Melanesian, dark skin, much more related to the people of Papua New Guinea and other peoples of South Pacific region than to the Polynesian people, Malaysian people of Indonesia and the rest of Asia. The people of East Timor used to live uh, in the mountain region. About 90% were subsistence farmers who tend their land for centuries. And uh, they lived peacefully. There was never starvation or shortage of food because majority of the population were subsistence farmers. East Timor is uh, potentially uh, very rich in agriculture. It produced uh, rice, corn, peanuts, and every kind of uh, uh, tropical fruit. And uh, the coastal area is extremely rich in fish. There is a lot of uh, wildlife in the country which uh, people uh, can live on. Well, people uh, often ask the question why we should care about a uh, tiny, uh, isolated, remote place such as East Timor, which they've never heard about. Uh, and it's, uh, in a way, a curious kind of question. I mean, there's a more general question, namely, why should we care about uh, being involved in uh, genocide or mass slaughter? Why should, it, why, why should Germans care about the uh, uh, slaughter of the Jews? Why should Russians care about the massacre of Afghans? Uh, why should we care about the people of East Timor? It's essentially the same question. Uh, the facts of the matter are that we are engaged, uh, our governments are engaged, and to the extent that we think we're responsible for the actions of our governments, we're engaged uh, in uh, a, a large-scale uh, mass slaughter, uh, to which the word genocide is not inappropriate, uh, in East Timor, and we have been so since 1975. So if we're concerned about uh, our bloody hands, uh, then we should be uh, concerned about East Timor. If, on the other hand, we think that uh, slaughter of people who get in our way is perfectly fine, not a problem, uh, uh, that our main goals are to enrich ourselves uh, and uh, crush anyone who happens to be in our path, uh, then, of course, there's no reason at all for us to be concerned about East Timor except to applaud the successes of uh, the United States and Canada and other countries in uh, facilitating uh, and uh, providing the requisite diplomatic and military support uh, for uh, uh, this, for the Indonesian attack. Canada doesn't have a lot of involvement in East Timor per se, but what is really important is Canada's involvement in Indonesia, which is the attacking nation. Uh, Canada has at least $1.4 billion invested in Indonesia, which makes it really unique. Canada is the largest Western investor there, just behind Japan and Hong Kong, and even ahead of the United States. Uh, we have more money, in fact, invested in Indonesia than we have anywhere else in the world except for the United States and Great Britain, which again is very strange. It's the one third world nation where we have real, real economic clout. Um, not only do we have really powerful investment there, which is mostly in the form of an Inco plant out in the jungle in Sulawesi, but we also have a trade surplus. Again, it's unique in the Pacific Rim. And we have a very, very big aid program, which uh, is the largest non-commonwealth program in the world. <laughs> Canada has always made quite a lot of money off selling arms to kill Asians with. I mean, one of the little known facts, I suppose, of Canada's military record is that the Vietnam War was a great boon to our military producers. We sold something like two billion dollars worth of armaments to the Americans to kill the Vietnamese and other Indo-Chinese with. That, uh, you know, catapulted us right into the top ten of uh, world military producers. And in fact, every single university in Canada made money off contracts to the American armed forces during that war. 
Now we've sort of continued in that tradition ever since. It's important to remember that when the Vietnamese war shut down in 1975, the one in East Timor started up. And ever since then we've been giving arms to the Indonesians to carry on that war with. Uh, this is in fact a copy of the Canadian Defence Products Guide. It's paid for by our tax money. And it goes out to people like the Indonesians so that they can see what they can buy, again, to kill people whose countries they are invading. We don't always know about which weapons are being sold because the Canadian government doesn't always admit to them being for military use. And in fact, it's not publicly, there's no public documentation which is readily available to find out what we're selling. But one of the biggest single sales that we know about recently was in February 1987. 100 engines, which are twin turbocraft engines, uh, the number is PT-63B, uh, were sold. They are made by Pratt & Whitney in Montreal, and they're for use in Bell 412 helicopters. They were flown to Bandung in Indonesia. They were assembled on an Air Force base. And uh, from there, we assume they're going to be used in East Timor because they're slow-moving counterinsurgency aircraft. They're very good for use in a war against guerrillas. Is the minister is the minister saying, uh, Mr. Speaker, that he has received from the foreign minister of Indonesia and from our ambassador in Indonesia and other sources a sufficient evidence that the military occupation of East Timor has come to an end, and that the massive uh, uh, human rights violations uh, have also come to an end? In a word, Mr. Speaker, yes. The honourable member for New Westminster, Coquitlam. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that is not the evidence, as the Minister knows, that we have received from Amnesty International, which is a body that we usually rely upon. Um, and particularly, if I may ask specifically, in my second question about Canadian arms exports to uh, uh, Indonesia, um, which have been going on during uh, the period of the uh, military occupation of East Timor, and uh, indeed to the tune of $2 million worth, of military goods. Um, next month, the uh, High Tech 87 is encouraging further military military exports to Indonesia. Will the minister uh, seriously look at the continuation of such exports in light of the reports uh, that we have received from very reliable sources? Mr. Speaker, uh, I know the honourable member takes these matters seriously and would not uh, would not want to uh, to engage in representations that would be misleading. Uh, she made reference to the export of military equipment. Uh, the military equipment in question is not arms. She made reference to uh, the question of massive violations of human rights and asked if I was satisfied that those were not occurring. I am satisfied that there are not massive violations of human rights. Uh, there was very legitimate room for concern uh, for a period of time with regard to the situation in East Timor. It is our information that uh, the co that cause for concern has diminished considerably. In, uh, in, in recent years, and I would uh, welcome the member to uh, uh, acquaint herself with the uh, current facts uh, in East Timor. Now, what happened at the United Nations was that there were a number of votes which denounced the invasion and called for immediate um, withdrawal of Indonesian troops and recognition of um, the right of East Timor not to be molested. Now, what happened each time was that Canada abstained. Until 1979, when it started voting along with Indonesia to say that it was a fait accompli, there was really nothing wrong with the occupation, and that uh, it was time to go on with what they called reconstruction. And this has been the line ever since of the Canadian government, that things are basically okay. There was a bad period at the beginning when there might have been a few little human rights violations and a few people killed, but basically things were fine. Now, this is a flat-out lie. The thing is that there has been a war going on ever since then. I mean, it's been 12 years now. It doesn't show any signs of stopping. Fredolin, the resistance, is as strong as it ever was. But yet the Canadian government refuses to admit that because to admit that would be to say that there is still a war going on, which is something that's insupportable. Fredolin was created uh, officially after the coup in Portugal in 1974, when the new regime in Portugal uh, liberalize uh, political life, allowing political activities to take place. Our goal was essentially to establish an independent East Timor. Never at one time in our uh, uh, political platform we uh, inscribe any label, any ideological label to ourselves. We were simply a nationalist front and we believed in improving the quality of life of the Timorese people. We start with uh, 
by organizing uh, literacy programs throughout the country, because in a country with more than 90% illiterate, in order to be able to mobilize the people to raise their political awareness, we had to give them some basic tools to understand what we wanted to do about with an independent East Timor. So we mobilized Timorese students from high school and the technical schools to go to the countryside and set up literacy schools on the basis of uh, Paul, the Paul Freire method. We also set up uh, cooperative schemes throughout the country. We brought too many villages in the remote interior, water projects, some housing projects, health care, that uh, they never had before. We believe that through these concrete uh, projects, we would uh, win the allegiance, the support of the people, because we were not simply uh, propagating uh, empty ideas, but we are in fact uh, working uh, with them to bring solutions to their concrete problems. The Indonesian, they use massive firepower to try to crush uh, Fretlin. What areas of East Timor are they controlling now? Oh, no, no, they, they do not control at all, just two hundreds and disorganized. They have no organization at all, so they, of course, they do not control. You can go everywhere. How can you explain all these um, Indonesian forces? in East Timor just for 200 people. We, we, we just waiting him in the villages to get them return home. We just only ask him to come to us. We send their family to come to us. And finally, they come to us. In the period of 77, 79, because of massive Indonesian invasion uh, offensive, with the increase in uh, military supplies from the Western Wall, Indonesia basically uh, almost defeated Fretli militarily. But uh, after a period of uh, reorganization, Fretli was able to emerge again by 1981. In 1982, Fretlin was able to relaunch its own military operations against the Indonesians. By 1983, Fretlin forced the Indonesians to come to the negotiation table. General uh, Puruwantu, the Indonesian military commander in East Timor, under instructions from the Indonesian Armed Forces Chief General Benny Murdani, sought talks with Fretlin. And why did they seek talks with Fretlin? Because the Indonesian army was unable, realized that it, it was unable to defeat Fretlin militarily. So by 1983 onwards, Fretlin increase in its organizational capabilities. It had captured a big amount of weapons and was able to deploy in the field up to 200, 400 men in engagements with the Indonesians. Today, Fretlin has about 3,000 troops. They are fighting because their land has been taken away from them. They have been uh, pushed away from the ancestral sacred lands in the mountains where they lived for thousands of years. And as long as the situation remains, and as long as foreigners occupy their land, be, a, be they Indonesians or whoever, they will continue to fight. There are an estimated 60,000 Timorese living in the mountains free of Indonesian occupation. The Indonesians have cut off information about the resistance movement to the outside world. Letters and images such as these recent photos are occasionally smuggled out, proof of the guerrillas' continued resistance and strength. Diplomatically, Fredolin and the Union for a Democratic Timor, UDT, have formed a political coalition. Together, they are counting on international pressure to force the Indonesian military to withdraw from their country. The United States, Canada, and so on have no particular interest in seeing the Timorese slaughter. They simply don't care. What they care about is ensuring that uh, Indonesia remains, continues to fulfill its function uh, as a source of uh, resources, raw materials, opportunities for investment, markets, uh, enabling, in the, in the first place, 
uh, assisting in the recovery of Japan, now uh, enriching uh, the West. Uh, it's essentially, as far as Canada is concerned, it's essentially the same as Indochina. Uh, Canada had no particular interest in seeing several million people slaughtered in uh, uh, Indochina, but it did have an interest in profit, uh, and therefore Canada became the uh, largest per capita war exporter in the world. Uh, during the Indochina War, enriching itself on the destruction of Indochina, while, of course, providing appropriate uh, hypocritical uh, uh, moralizing about uh, the evil of the American uh, uh, bombers and so on and so forth. That's standard and typical, and the East Timor situation is simply one case in point. So the silence of the West concerning East Timor is completely understandable. Uh, the reality is unpleasant. Uh, and therefore it's better not to know about it. And the uh, ideological institutions perform their task very effectively. They keep us from knowing about it. At the United Nations, Canada continues to vote in favor of Indonesia's occupation of East Timor. Amnesty International estimates that one-third of the Timorese have died as a result of the Indonesian invasion and occupation. In addition to brutal murders, torture, and other human rights violations, Indonesia is imposing a program of forced sterilization and birth control on Timorese women. Without opposition, this genocide will continue. It's difficult to think of a world situation in which Canadian activism would have more punch than the Indonesian East Timor situation. Uh, Indonesia is extremely sensitive to world opinion and particularly Canadian opinion. And this is a case where even the most simple letter writing, if that's all that people choose to do, would have a very powerful effect. People could write to their MPs, to the government, to CETA to criticize aid programs which are badly being used. They can criticize military production. They can write to the Indonesian government itself. All these things would be quite powerful and they're very easy to do. There are other things that they can do. Uh, people can, either individually or through groups they're already involved in, educate their local neighborhoods about East Timor and try to get other forms of activism started up. There is, in fact, a wide range of things that they could do, right up to nonviolent civil disobedience, for example, to possibly blockade the sale of military products to Indonesia, which is, I think, quite important because that's going up as well. Let's return once again to the new war, the Gulf War, and have economist Harry Cleaver explain to us the economic consequences. Uh, what about the U.S. economy and the recession at home and the economic problems at home? Uh, were they a factor in this, you suppose? Well, one thing is, is quite clear, and that is the recession was well underway before the Iraqi invasion. So neither Baker nor Bush nor any other White House spokesperson can get or should be able to get away with claiming that the war is responsible for the recession. 
The recession was being provoked, has been coming on now for quite some time. Housing starts or have been going downhill for over four, four years. But the most immediate precipitating element of the recession was the tight money policies of the Federal Reserve. Uh, in fact, the Federal Reserve was following a strategy of pushing inflation down towards zero. It's called a zero inflation strategy, something nobody has ever tried to do, but which requires tight money control, right, high interest rates, uh, in order to, to uh, put a constraint on the economy. I mean, this is the same kind of policy which Reagan followed back in 1981, which threw the world into a, into a giant depression. Right? So this was going on before. High oil prices would have contributed to this. Right? Increased oil prices means a decreased availability of energy, means a diversion of resources to pay for the oil, which might other, by, otherwise be spent, say, on consumer goods. High oil prices mean higher gas prices, which means if we drive the same number of miles, we have less money to spend elsewhere. That contributes to the recession. So all of these things were going on before. Uh, when when you, you ask yourself, why are we having a zero inflationary strategy when inflation is only running at 3 or 4%? I mean, this was an inflation which back in the early 60s, during the last very long period of economic growth, nobody batted an eye at. And it seems as if what we had was a renewal of the Reagan policy of smashing down American standards of living, reducing wages. Right? Because that's what the unemployment has done over the last decade. It has dramatically cut not only real wages, but even money wages. Harry, I have a related economic uh, question. The impact of military expend spending, one, on the deficit, and then two, just more generally, the ramifications for the future economy. With respect to the deficit, the situation is going to be very much like the situation at the beginning of the Reagan administration. The only way to avoid a massive increase in the deficit if you increase military expenditure, like any other expenditure, is to borrow the money, which would mean a, tr a dramatic increase in the debt. H however, uh, we can suspect, and I think indeed this budget, this budget already suggests this, that before they go that route, they'll try their f preferred route, and that is to pay for these expenditures by reducing so social service expenditures that they're going to try to chop uh, not merely the payments and programs for the very poor, but the entitlement programs. And of course, they'll do it by going after the upper and middle income people, right? Say, well, let's, we'll start here by chopping Social Security benefits for people with incomes over a certain level. Uh, but we should keep in mind that the same people who are advising Bush were out to get rid of Social Security in the Reagan administration. They're out to wipe out these social services programs. So they, uh, my guess is they're going to try to do that again. And so the people who were, who were able to stymie much of these cutbacks back in the early 80s had better be on their toes and prepared to go uh, to the barricades over this again. And if they do, then the only way they're going to be able to increase the military expenditures of the sort that you're describing is by borrowing more money. And the thing of it is, that, and this comes to the other side of your question, the only way they can borrow more money is to drive up the interest rate so that money will be willing to come in to the United States, right? So to buy federal securities. But if they drive up the interest rate, that's going to either deepen or re reignite, if it's gone away, the, uh, the recession, the depression, the, the, which, me, which would mean that the, the implications of this is that while the government is spending a tremendous amount of money, this is like the first years of the Reagan administration, financing a huge ex growth in the military industrial complex, the rest of the country is being starved for capital. The, I mean, even from a capitalist point of view, the only people who are going to benefit from this are the people who are tied into the military industrial complex. All the other co companies out there, right, who would like to be able to borrow money are being what economists like to call crowded out of the capital market by these huge demands. So Bush's vision, right, of the America, of Pax Americana, uh, of the next period of Pax Americana, seems to be not only that the United States will be a global cop, but the American economy will be geared almost uniquely to providing the weaponry, right, and the backup for that g role on an international basis. The fact that there is a com there's a continuing refusal within the Bush administration for any kind of reindustrialization program, for any kind of economic policies which would 
uh, support, uh, a, re a revitalization, let's say, of the consumer goods industry so they could compete with the West Europeans and the Japanese. The absence of those things uh, suggests that we're headed into a future which, on the one hand, has this incredibly wealthy military-industrial complex supporting the role, you know, you know, global role of the United States as, as global cop, and on the other hand, uh, continued widespread poverty, uh, continued decline in American standard of living of the average Americans, no solution to the problems of the cities. In fact, this is something that you might want to take up at some point in the future. The cities uh, and the states are now entering into increasingly difficult uh, fiscal crises in which they're unable to, co to cope, which means more cutbacks, again, at the local level, only now it's not the federal level, it's been kicked down to the local level, which means worse con worsening conditions in the central cities and the ghettos and so on, worsening conditions in the countryside, uh, which is where there's people are supported by state programs who but don't even, have the resources. Even business is going down the tubes. I've been noticing as I watch the Persian Gulf War that every day you have a new bankruptcy. You have Chrysler suspending uh, production. You have the automotive uh, industry going out of business. You see dealer after dealer packing up and closing uh, down. People just aren't buying uh, cars. You airlines, see the airlines, airlines going, going out of uh, <clears throat> business. The biggest West Coast uh, real, real retailer uh, that owned all these department store chains went uh, bankrupt. Sears was laying off all these uh, employers. So it looked like every sector of capital, except for big oil, except for the military sector, except for the entertainment uh, industry. And the health industry. And the health industry was suffering. So this is a really uneven uh, the problem, economic... The problem is to sort out how much of this is cyclical, mm -hmm. because this happens every time the economy goes into a downturn. And how much of it is a long-run phenomena? In other words, it is one of the most basic and long-lasting aspects of capitalism everywhere that during a downturn, weak companies go under, that there's a centralization and concentration of capital in the hands of a smaller number of companies. That always goes on. It's the sectoral difference, which is interesting for the long term here, is that it may not simply be that Flint, Michigan is being closed down, right? And auto plants are being opened in uh, Mexico for re-export to the United States. It may be that indeed, if the long-term economic plans are for continued reductions in the American standard of living, that even Mexican automobile exports will decline as the average American will be able to buy less and less real wealth. So the prospects, right, are not, are not merely cyclical downturn, but secular stagnation for important sectors of the American economy and for certain very large sectors of the American population. Not everybody, mind you. It's uneven. Some people benefit, some people... Fail. Everybody who's tied into the military-industrial complex, if Bush's budget goes through, mm -hmm. which we can try to prevent that from happening, of course, they're going to be sitting pretty. But what it's going to be based on is enormous redistribution of income and wealth from part of the population to a very small part of the population. Harry, to conclude this uh, discussion, how do you see the Persian Gulf War fitting into all of this? Does this solve some of the economic problems we've been talking about, or does it worsen them? How, what do you think Bush's vision of this war is in terms of the economy? Obviously, he has political interests. There's military, bureaucratic interests that we haven't even talked about in the show. But just from the standpoint of the economy, because Bush is also a member of this capitalist uh, ruling class, what is the economic rationality or irrationality of the Persian Gulf War in terms of how it fits into this big economic picture that you sketched out? Well, the irrationality behind it is that it's hard to believe, but it's hard at this point to conclude otherwise, that Bush really thinks that he can base the American economic future on the military-industrial complex. I'm not one of those who believes that the post-war period was based on the permanent arms economy. There's no doubt we had a Korean War and we had military aid overseas and we had the Vietnam War and military expenditure played a big role. But in quantitative terms, the long-term growth of the American economy after World War II was based on the expansion of wages and consumption. Compared to a lot of parts of the world, it was a progressive solution to the capitalist economic problem of how to put people to work for life and keep them there. It was progressive because it was based on rising standards of living. What I don't see in Bush's economic pol policies 
and his vision, and you know he, uh, he doesn't like the vision thing much, so I'm not sure there is any vision. But what I don't see in it is any indication of such a long-term rise in American standards of living. On the contrary, the cyclical downturn begins to look like secular stagnation in standards of living. That the basis of expanded demand in his mind is expanded government demand for bombs, missiles, Star Wars systems, etc. The, the, what the Gulf War provides is a paradigm for how to get rid of all this junk once it's been produced at taxpayer expense. Right? I mean, it's always a problem. You can only pile up bombs for so long and then people begin to notice that you have this tremendous quantity of stuff and maybe you ought to cut back and feed a few starving but children. But it also gets into war. If you have this stockpile, you have to use it to justify getting the cycle moving again. Well, th there's an alternative. And the, the alternative, uh, which for a while we thought the Reagan administration was pursuing, was rapid technological change, right? And to a certain degree, we're now seeing that, we're now seeing that on the nightly shots of... Uh, television through the nose of the of the bomb right you get a, a rapid turnover in the technology so you get throw away the old bomb well the rationality is that it helps a relatively small number of people make a hell of a lot of money and it takes away considerable amounts of money from the vast majority of the americans and that's alternative views for this time frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on alternative views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We also can provide you with information on how to get some of the publications by former CIA officer John Stockwell. We'd like to thank our crew who made our program possible. Brian Lynch was our director. Georgia List, Michael Ferris, Lori Lackland, Melissa Crowley all helped with the audio and the camera work. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. I'll leave this up a few minutes longer so you can jot it down if you'd like to write to us. A lot of people say that they we don't leave this sign up long enough to give them time enough to jot it down because they would like to contact us and Give us some uh, feedback on the program. That's Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Okay, you got that? Fine. We'll be looking forward to your letter. Goodbye. <laughs>